So what you see here is my dashboard. I wouldn't take any, uh, I, I wouldn't assume that anything that I'm following on this dashboard is something that you should be investing in. So don't don't take my, my dashboard as being something that represents investing advice or some kinds of secret sauce that you guys should be, be following. I do follow a lot of companies that I don't particularly want to invest in. So that's just kind of you know, letting you know that. But what you can see here is I've got a, a heat map of stock. Obviously, you've got AMC, you've got BD, you've got all the recent uh, uh, stocks that have been making the news. Um, and you can see that this kind of shows you what they've done in the last day. If you want to add tickers to this, you can do simply, uh, uh, you can simply type in stuff like GE and it will quickly add something to your to your stock list, to your, to your dashboard. It's also possible to manage this list with stock lists. So I have um, a couple lists here that I can, I can organize my, my lists. In order to set up a stock list, you go over here to settings, you click on the down uh, arrow to open up this, this, this folder, you click on stock lists. And now you can see that I have two of them here. My default list <coughs> is a follow list. And if I'm out on Fintel somewhere and I see a button that says follow this company and I click follow this company, it's going to put that company in this default follow list. But I can also create uh, uh, other types of lists, uh, such as large caps or technology or things like that. Um, and I can say things like, here's a technology and I can add um, What's a company that I, we'll, we'll add Snapchat, right? So here's Snapchat. And now I've added this just to my list. And when I go back to my overview, I can actually see this will, this will refresh in a second. There's a lot of caching that takes place, but at some point I'll be able to see my technology list and so forth. So this is kind of how we do it. Now on this overview page, uh, besides having the heat map at the top, we have um, news from their dashboard. Uh, so this is going to have news that are, are all uh, a list of news headlines that are relevant to the stocks that are in your dashboard. Uh, we've got SEC filings. So any relevant SEC filings that we think are important will, will show up here. And the types of SEC filings that we think are important include things like 10Ks, 10Qs, 8Ks, 6Ks, which are basically 8Ks with the foreign companies, um, 13Gs, which are basically invest. Uh, ownership filings and so forth. Uh, obviously proxy statements, uh, uh, S1 filings that indicate kind of uh, offerings or potential dilution are important. And, and just in regards to SEC filings, I mean, my, my philosophy is that the SEC filings are really probably more important than the news. There's a story, uh, there's an academic study somewhere that said that they, uh, they gave a certain number of asset managers. They did a study and they said a certain number of asset managers don't read any of the news. And they said to the other asset managers, read the news. And it turns out the ones that didn't read the news actually did better uh, performance-wise. And so a lot of the news is, is just noise, in my opinion. But if a company, uh, if there's news for a company and the company management believes that it's a material, it's going to have a material effect on the share price, they have to disclose that news to the SEC and to the public. And so you know, there's really, in my opinion, no better arbiter of what's newsworthy than the company itself. Because if they don't disclose the news that's, and, and the share price moves significantly, then what happens is they get sued for, um, um, you know, for not disclosing something that shouldn't have been disclosed. So they're going to disclose stuff, and it's going to be in the 8Ks, and it's going to be in the filing. So always check the filings and always, you know, pay attention to these because it's important. And here's just, here's just a current report from NIO. Um, it's, it's not always going to be market moving, but here's where they talk about they delivered 7,000 vehicles, increasing by 350%. So that's, that's good, right? This is in the SEC bank. You don't have to go to, you know, um, any news site for that. It's right here in the filings. Um, the other thing that we follow is insider transactions. Obviously companies that have um, corporate insiders, uh, these VPs, board members, and significant shareholders, you know, all have to disclose their filing. It's not illegal for companies, for, for insiders to trade in their own shares. It's only illegal if they have material non-public information. This is something that's really important. I've actually done a, a 
tutorial on this uh, on the YouTube channel. So if you're interested in that, uh, go, go read it. But basically, this is going to show you who's buying and who's selling exercise from your shares in your portfolio companies. Uh, pretty much, I don't want to say it's in real time, but insider trades have to be reported within two days of, of, of the actual trade. So it's about as close to real time as you can get. Uh, and in terms of timing, we get all of our data from the SEC and we ping the SEC every 60 seconds to the filings. And so it's, it's pretty quick. Um, in addition, I'm not sure why I'm not getting advanced uh, ownership metrics here, but um, we should be getting ownership transactions here. Um, besides insider transactions, I'll take a look at that. Um, but you should be able to see them like over here, for example. Here, here they are. So in addition to all those, those things on the, on the overview, we also have kind of larger pages over here to the left that kind of, kind of gives you more, more depth and more detail. Um, and goes and allows you to page through a little bit more. So any questions about this so far? This is kind of the, the core of what Fintel's dashboard does. Um, how did you access the SEC filings? I went over here to the left of the nav bar and I clicked on SEC filings and then there's the SEC filings. Um, you do not have to subscribe to anything further than a quarterly subscription in order to see all the insider transactions. So if you're a premium member and you've paid, then you should have, you, if, you, if you've paid your money, then you should have access to everything. Uh, this issue down here is, is, a, is a bug of some type that, that must have cropped up recently because, um, and I'm actually not logged in as a, a, as a premium member, so it could be something that just affects my own, my own account. How recent is the information? So it depends on the information. As I said, uh, instead of trades um, are reported within two days uh, and we get the data once it's reported to the SEC within, within 60 seconds or so. Uh, ownership data, depending on the ownership data, uh, is going to be somewhat delayed. 13F filings are required uh, by large institutions every, um, every quarter and they have required to report uh, within 45 days after the quarter. So there's a lot of different filing deadlines. I'm not gonna go into them all right now. There's actually a, a, a help article that we wrote, a knowledge-based article about this, just because the, um, the requirements are very different for all filings. Um, if you have a padlock and you're a paid member, then talk to us, talk to me after the, after the webinar, we can fix that for you. Um, in addition, it's possible, a lot of people like to follow funds. So we have a lot of ownership data in Intel and we have um, funds. So if you, for example, um, are interested in the Baker Brothers, which is a well-known hedge fund, um, and they do a lot of biotech, okay? And you wanna understand like what they're investing in, okay? You can go to the Baker Brothers uh, page on Fintel and then, add this fund to your dashboard. I've already added it, so this button says remove, right? So I can add this fund to my dashboard. All the funds that you follow are going to be up here. Um, if you're not following any, then we're gonna seed this list with a bunch of ones that we think are interesting, okay? So these are all the funds that I'm following, okay? 0.72, well-known you know, hedge fund, perceptive advisors, Melvin Capital Management made the news because they were the ones shorting, shorting GameStop. Um, so, you know, once you follow these guys, then you can see these institutions over here. This, this button will pop up and you can see what they're following. So we're looking at, this is not showing you the companies that, that I'm following. This is showing you the companies that are held by the institutions that I'm following. So I can see here that Toes Corp has exited Google. I can see that the state of New Jersey comma has exited my land, so forth, okay. Um, uh, institutions, this is, all right. Um, all right, so then what else? We have a, uh, uh, some teams, some, some message boards and some collaboration tools that, that I think are important. Everybody who signs up becomes a member of the welcome team. I encourage you guys to come over here and, and, and uh, participate. Uh, I'm on here and I try to answer questions on the welcome team for quite frequently and I announce new product uh, uh, ideas and announce kind of engineering updates on that. And then we have um, the ability to see 
uh, screens. And, and, that, and that's kind of it for the dashboard. In terms of alerts, a lot of people ask about alerts. We have a certain, we have a certain number of global alerts that are interesting. People frequently want to know, um, they want to be able to set up an alert um, anytime they, um, uh, insider buy something or anytime an insider buys something with a, that's value of 25k or anytime there's a there's a insider so that, that kind of stuff we have these alerts here that you can set up we have um the ability to get email alerts whenever your the funds that you're following do important things this is here and then we have this kind of company alerts thing where we can set up you can set up kind of email alerts for them and the kinds of alerts that we send are, are basically we, we curate this list and so we're going to send you an email anytime there's a uh, significant filing, uh, proxy statement, uh, S1 statement, that kind of thing. The same kind of stuff that shows up on your dashboard. Um, we're, we're working on expanding this to provide a lot more granularity so that you would be able to say, send me an email anytime somebody files form XYZ, that kind of thing. So that's been that's in development still. Um, and then, of course, if you want to see your alerts, you can come over here. We actually have built this out. Um, a lot of people get the email alerts. Sometimes I find that email alerts are a little bit hard to manage. And so any email alert that you get is going to also be mirrored in here. You can come in here and take a look at the detail. Um, uh, and you can see kind of like you know, what the security was, how what the shares were, and so forth, and go get more information this way. Um, so I, you know, we spend a lot of time on this. So I hope you like it. Like it. If you have any questions about this, let me know, and and I can try to answer your questions about that. So that's the basics of, of the dashboard. Can you see who is holding short positions? Right. So, um, so the answer is if they have disclosed them. So let's talk about short data because everybody seems to want to know about short data. Um, if I let's just kind of step back for a second. Um, if you guys all recall. Uh, Melvin Capital and GME made the news because Melvin Capital was 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 shorting um, GameStop, and you know the Wall Street bets guys got on board and decided that they were going to try to create a short squeeze, and um, and and they did. It was successful. It was the most successful short squeeze squeeze in history. And so I went and did a I did a search on Melvin Capital and GME, and you can see here the news. Uh, but if you go a little bit further down, you can actually see. Uh, Melvin Capital Ownership and GME from Pinto. This is our page here. And if you click through on this, what I find is interesting is that Melvin Capital does not actually disclose any traditional short positions. And let's talk about that for a second. There's, there's really two ways to short a stock. One of them is to borrow shares from your broker and then and then sell it, you know, and then, and then commit to, uh, and then sell it and then the idea is you buy it back at a lower price later on. That's really the traditional way of, of, of shorting a stock. And that's what you think about when you talk about short interest. But if you look at Melvin Capital, and this would show you all of the short positions that Melvin Capital has, they don't have any. They have not disclosed any. What they have disclosed is a very, very, very high uh, number of put options, which is another way to short a stock. So it's interesting because uh, you can see that over the years, that their number of put op, uh, put options has climbed and climbed and climbed and climbed. But if you were just looking at short interest, this wouldn't even register. Uh, um, um, so, you know, but you can see that here. You can see the disclosed put options, and you can see that their numbers have gone higher and higher and higher over the years. So the question that you ask is, can you see companies holding short positions? The answer is yes, if they've disclosed them. So let's talk about more short positions here. Uh, we've talked about the put options. Uh, uh, we, we, we at least we're, we're going to get there. Okay, we're going to get to how you can check this stuff. Okay, so I just want to make sure you all understand like what a put option is and what a uh, and what a, or what a traditional short option. Is. You can actually go to um, to GameStop, for example, um, and I can say uh, GameStop institutional ownership right here. And I can see the, the ratio of put options to call options. The put are the red and the, and the green are the, are, the, are the calls. I can actually come down here and I can, and I can um, you know, sort this. I can do a little, I can say put in here and I can see all the put options and I can sort it by shares. And obviously the largest 
Holder of Put Options is, is Melvin. The second one is, is Susquehanna Capital International Group and so forth. Okay. Now, if you want to see uh, funds that have disclosed kind of traditional short positions, you can sort this by shares. And what you're going to see is you've got one company here that's got negative 5,000 shares. And so that is a traditional short position where they've borrowed uh, and uh, and that's kind of what that looks like there. There's only one company here in GameStop that's actually got a disclosed short position here. Uh, you can also go over here to ownership, short interest owners. And uh, I've got that same data here. I don't have the put options here, but, but, but I've got the, the traditional short borrow uh, uh, holders here. And then the question then comes, you know, how do you, how do you figure out, um, like how do you discover new companies, right? So let's go talk about short data here. Uh, I'm gonna go to Tesla. I'm gonna go to the, I'm gonna go search for Tesla here. Tesla short. And I'm going to go look at the short interest of Tesla. I'm gonna kind of walk you through the short interest page that, that, that we have for Fintel. We have a lot of short interest related data. And what we do is we organize this from kind of the more, the more frequent data to the less frequent data. Uh, one of the things that we get from a broker is a, a list of short shares that are available to be borrowed. Uh, and we get this every 30 minutes from, from our broker. And we display the changes here on the right-hand side. So you can see Tesla has got 10 million. They don't tell us anything more than 10 minutes. So, so Tesla has, it's very easy to short Tesla. But if you look at GameStop, uh, right now, um, it went from 700 to 900,000, uh, down to 9,000 on the 28th. I know it was zero. Four hours ago, it suddenly became 5,500. Uh, so I'm sorry, 550,000. So you can see that this is changing on a, on a regular basis. And so this is actually a really interesting metric for people who trade frequently or actively because it shows you uh, kind of intraday numbers. Um, in addition to that, there's these fee rates. So this is the interest rates that people pay if whenever they want to borrow uh, shares. And this is kind of a kind of a esoteric part of, of securities financing. But you know, the higher the interest rate, the, the harder it is to short. And so this is something that is also updated throughout the day. You can see that we checked this last 16 minutes ago. And the last change was 48 minutes ago. And you can see it's becoming easier and easier to um to borrow uh, for, for GameStop shares, okay? It was 50%, you know, last week, and now it's down to 10%. Um, now, if we keep going down here, we have the short volume is the next thing that we're talking about. Um, short volume is, is, the, the, is not short interest. Short volume is the number of shares traded in a given day that are marked as short sales. So it's, it's really kind of another indicator. The good news is that it comes in a daily basis. So it's kind of, you know, it's not short interest and it's not necessarily a, an indicator that there's a short squeeze happening. It just shows you the total number of the total volume of shares. And so you can see, um, you can see all of this kind of like short volume ratio changing on a daily basis here. Uh, and there's a little graph here for you. And then we have these institutional put call ratios. So if you go back to GameStop, I'm sorry, if you go back to Melvin Capital, if you recall that, that, um, that uh, where, where did it go? Um, I'm not sure if I have it here anymore. But if you take the total number of companies, the total number of put ratio, put calls, and the total number of call, I'm sorry, the total number of put options, and the total number of call options, and you divide them, you divide the number of put options by the number of call options, you're gonna get the put call ratio. And a higher put call ratio means that you're going to um, you're going to have a higher it's going to be basically a higher short position so with with each game stop we've got 2.78 with tesla we've got um 1.59 so you can see that tesla is and you can conclude here that tesla is less shorted than than gamestop um 
and this is actually really interesting because this is looking at the options. And, and if you were looking at traditional uh, short interest, you wouldn't see like Melvin Capital in that, but with this, you're gonna catch or capture all those companies that have options. And of course you have the, the traditional short interest. Short interest um, is published twice a month, uh, the 15th and at the end of the month, mid month and end of the month. It's, it's published by the stock exchanges. Um, so we get this from NASDAQ. And you can see that the short interest um, here has been uh, declining in the last 15 days. And the short interest percentage of float is 7.43. So this is really kind of the metric that people are looking for when they're trying to figure out if there's a short squeeze. If the total short interest climbs significantly as a percentage of float, then it's gonna get harder and harder and harder for short holders to to, um, to cover those shares if the price goes up. And so then they have to go out and they have to buy more shares and so forth. And you guys kind of know how that works. So if you don't know how it works, it's very easy to do a Google search to see how short squeezes work. Um, and so this kind of talks about how uh, uh, you can kind of capture who's, what, what are the likely likelihoods of this. Now, the other thing that's interesting here is that we've got, we've started adding these kind of leaderboards so I don't have a leaderboard for shortages as a percentage of float yet. That'll happen in a, another day or two. But if you look at the put call ratios, I can click on put call ratio and I can see the list of companies that have the top 200 the companies with the highest put call ratio. So this is pretty, pretty extreme. Uh, for every one share of, for every one call option disclosed by institutions, there's 223,900 put options disclosed by institutions. And so, Here's a, here's a couple of extreme, really, really extreme uh, 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 situations where companies are heavily shorted using options, not with, 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 uh, with borrowed shares. So you would ask, somebody had asked about where do you find the companies that have a high short, you know, high likelihood of short. This is it right here, this is the page. You can also look at, um, if I go back up here and I take off the, um, the actual, term there and I just go to the ranking page, I can actually see a list of all the ranking factors that we have. So that was stock owners put call ratio. I can look at the short volume ratio as well and see the companies that have the highest short volume ratio. Um, if you're shorting, you're, you're buying a put. Um, and I can go things, I can see things like insider sell by ratio, which is another really interesting um, metric that talks about number of insiders. Um, here's the page for the ranking page here. I'll just put it in the chat. Um, there. Um, that's right, thank you for adding to that. So the, you know, so there's some really interesting metrics in here uh, that, that we're trying to, to build ranking pages for. Um, the most interesting ones to me are um, the net buyer shares volume over float. So this is basically um, takes the total number of shares bought in the last 90 days by insiders and divides them by the float. In many cases, you have a situation where that value is over 100%. How can that be? Well, in, in many cases, this is because of a buyout. I don't know the specifics of these, but. I've been, this is a pretty new metric. I've been following it for a couple, couple weeks or so. And um, I occasionally find companies that have a, high, a, a value that's higher than 100%. And typically when I look into them, what I find is that some hedge fund or some venture fund um, bought in or there was some kind of m and activity. Uh, but this is actually really interesting because it shows a very high degree, high amount of, of insider sent, positive sentiment in companies. Um, uh, you can also look at insider net buyer count, which is the, the, the um, total number of insiders buying minus the total number of insiders selling. So in this case, we had 18 different insiders buying in the previous 90 days. So you're, you're using kind of the wisdom of the crowds here uh, uh, to determine which is a good, which is a good, they're not looking just at the shares, we're looking at the total number of, of the actual individuals or entities that are buying. Um, and then you can look at the inside of sell buy ratio, which is probably as, as interesting for um, 
this is basically the total number of insiders selling divided by the total number of insiders buying. Um, any questions so far about this stuff? We're kind of, kind of jumping around here, but you know, I'm trying to, to, to show you guys some of the, the data that's really interesting uh, to me. Um, we'll go back to that short interest page. Where's this ranking page? Is that what you're asking me? I just, I literally just put it in the, in the, um, in this chat there. Um, uh, do I have help docs explaining each metrics? Um, I don't yet, but we're going to add like a data dictionary for that. Um, so, and that's something I need to be working on soon. And that's kind of why I'm getting these demos because I don't really have um, help uh, a, a dictionary for this stuff yet. So let's go back to short interest. Do you guys have any questions about the short interest? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, there's one other thing. There's, in addition to this short interest data, um, we also have a list of all the funds. So I try to put all of the data that I can find, all of the funds that I can find uh, uh, on this page as well, all the co companies that have disclosed short positions. So here where I talk, here's where I talk about traditional short positions where stocks are borrowed. And then option-based shorting with put options where, where they're not borrowing, they're, they're actually buying puts. So uh, if I sort this, I can see that for, for Tesla, uh, Colomos Market Neutral Income Fund, you know, has got a very, 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 very negative uh, uh, short position on, on Tesla. And then there's a couple other companies. So these are all, all the companies, all these negative numbers here in this column, current shares are all companies that have taken out short positions in Tesla. And most of them seem to be increasing their short positions. You can see 552% increase, 338% increase and so forth. Some of them are flat. Okay, you can see, you can see that here, right? And then, and then down here we have the puts. So if I just, I can filter this and I can, well, I thought I could filter it, but I guess I can't. Um, you, can you can sort this by puts now and say like, these are the largest holder of puts is Susquehanna International Group, and um, and then the next would be SG Americas and so forth, and Citadel and so forth. It's possible that these companies might also have call positions, so that they're market neutral. But you know, the goal here is to really kind of show you who has the largest negative, who has the largest uh, uh, put positions here. Um, okay. Any uh, so let me go back to your uh, the chat here and see what if I can see here. Um, Puts ranking page, if you're shorting, you're buying, yeah, okay. So how do you get the option of ETF or company? I don't know the question. I don't know what that means. Uh, email support, yeah, we have email support. It's, we're sometimes a little bit slow with this. Um, <coughs> can you see what the put holdings were for? So these put holdings, I'm looking at the Tesla short page. So it's, it's, a te it's, a, it's, it's for Tesla here. This is the Tesla short interest page. Um, you cannot see, unfortunately, there's no way to see what the strike prices were for uh, <coughs> in these listings. They don't disclose those. Um, so let's go take a look at the screener here real quick. Um, uh, here's another little thing that we do. This is basically allows you to do a filter on the stock market. I actually do a whole webinar on, on the screener in and of itself. So I won't go too far into this, but basically it allows you to, to put in some simple expressions here and then click on get results and it basically runs this expressions this these these formulas across every company in the universe in our universe which is the us and then um kind of returns the results okay so i want you guys to just kind of see how this works um let's talk about insider data here if i go to tesla insider trades um, into the trading report. Um, I feel very strongly that, that, that um, insiders are a good indicator of overall sentiment uh, uh, in, a, in a company. Um, I know that it's true that, you know, a lot of executives get, uh, get paid in, in, in stock options. And so they're selling generally a lot to get paid. And I, and I get that, but it's interesting that you can see like, you know, you can actually, we're actually tracking like what is the performance of a company. So take a look at this, this chart here. You can see here, uh, we're really looking at the track records of, of, of insiders. And let me kind of back up a little bit. 
there's a lot of academic research that says that insiders tend to outperform the market or, or, or actually generate excess returns uh, when trading in their own company. As I said earlier, insiders are not allowed to trade if they have material non-public information about the company. So they, if they know, for example, that they're going to make an announcement that the earnings uh, missed expectations, they're not allowed to make a trade or that would be illegal. But if they have a general idea that the company's doing well, or the company's doing poorly, and they don't have any specific material non-public information, then they're allowed to sell or they're allowed to buy. Or if they think that the industry is doing poorly, they can sell. Or if they think that the industry is going to do well, they can, they can buy, that, that type of stuff. And people that are running these companies generally are very astute about their own situations. And so um, what we're trying to do here at Fintel is to track these insiders and to actually find out which insiders do well and which ones don't do well. And so, for example, what we have here uh, is a track record of insider purchases. And we can see that Elon Musk uh, on the 20th of on February 14th uh, bought 13,000 shares. If we come over here to this chart, we can see that, well, let me just kind of step back. Over here on this list is the list of all of the people, all of the insider trades that were bought in recent history that were not planned, okay? So many people understand and recognize that there are uh, uh, stock planners and, and, and insiders can, can set up a, a written plan, give it to the broker and say, you're gonna trade my shares on this plan. And that's one of the ways that, that insiders can kind of get out of the uh, uh, trouble when, when, when being accused of insider trades. All of those trades, we can track them and we know which ones are planned. So for example, I can see that in this transaction history, Andrew Baglino and Drone has, has made a number of trades, but they've all been part of 10B51 plans here. So there's, you know, it's not really that interesting to me. What's interesting to me are the trades that are not part of in, uh, 10B51 plans. And so if you keep going down here, sooner or later you're gonna find some, or you can just look at this chart here. So here's the chart. Here's the list of all the trades that were made that were not pre-planned by, by an insider. And here's the, the list of all the sales that were not pre-planned. Now, Elon Musk perhaps is not the best example, or, or Tesla perhaps is not the best example because the share price has only gone up over the last couple of years. But if you were to take a look at this um, and, and, and look at other companies and look at the trades that were made, you would actually be able to see like what was the actual profit, the potential returns from these? These are kind of theoretical returns. If Elon Musk, Elon Musk made this trade on the on the on the February 14th at a reported share price of $767 and it cost him about $10 million. Uh, since then, the price has gone to $22.38 and he's made 191% return on this. So he's done pretty well in his own company. You can see the maximum theoretical return over here on the right. On the right-hand side, or down here, you can see trades that were sold and you can see kind of how much loss they avoided when in these trades. So this guy made all these trades on the same day and you know they all basically avoided losing about 8% of their total, total value here. Um, any questions about this so far? Let's go to AMC um, or I don't know. I'm, I'm gonna try BlackBerry just because I don't, we don't have a lot of stuff with BlackBerry. Um, yeah, okay. So here's here's a situation here where two people made trades almost on the same, within the same week, February 8th, I'm sorry, April 8th and April 3rd, two different people bought 10,000 shares on an open market, on the open market. And they went along pretty much unchanged for about 260 days. And then suddenly they went to $25. Okay, so look at that. What a beautiful chart here. So what does that tell you? Like, if these guys, these, these guys do really well, they've only made one trade, as far as we can tell, in the last, one trade each in the last, I don't know, five or 10 years. And they were huge winners. Okay, do you guys see that? Do you guys still hear me? Um, okay. Is there anybody in the chat still? Okay, all right, there you go, okay. 
Uh, cool. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm really trying to work hard to try to figure out how to tease this information out. Uh, and I hope you guys can kind of see the value here. It's not always easy, but, you know, this is a, this is kind of a, and I didn't know about BlackBerry before I came here. I've been just, I kind of go around and I kind of look at companies and try to find these kinds of situations, these kinds of setups. But, you know, if Billy Ho buys more trades of BlackBerry, in, you know, in the next day or two, then you really should pay attention to this guy. And, and what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to set up a way for, for us to get alerts for stuff like this. But, you know, ultimately, you know, what you might do is you might go subscribe to Blackberry and to kind of look for, for Billy Ho's trades or for Barbara's trades, you know, that kind of thing. Um, in addition to that, you know, here's another situation where Billy Ho sold shares on the 20th and he sold 20,000 shares and he avoided, and, and subsequent to that, 13 days later, the share price went from 12.95 to, to 11.55. Uh, he avoided losing uh, $28,000. He avoided losing 10%, almost 11% of that of that um, of that value. So that's the idea here: is we're trying to look at the the actual post trade performance of insiders in their own companies to determine who is doing really well and who is doing not. Um, one of the projects underway right now is to provide a leaderboard of, you know, the best trades, you know, so the best insider trades in the last year or the person or the insider with the best track records. And so, you know, that's kind of, kind of, and then, and then be able to follow them and kind of make them famous perhaps. So that's kind of one of the things that I've been working on. Um, would you guys, would that be interesting to you guys? How complete is this data set? So we go back to, two, we go to back to 2012 for, for all of our SEC data. Um, um, you do not, so do you need to learn the program? So I don't, I don't think so. I mean, really, this is just, this is not a programming language. This is just expressions, right? Um, this, this is a language. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of a reduced language. Uh, and we're gonna kind of build it up more, but we're trying to make this pretty simple. And in addition to that, we're actually working on building a drag and drop feature on this as well. Um, so that people who don't, who are not comfortable with kind of building text expressions here can kind of drag and drop their, 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 their stuff. One of the things that's interesting about this, and just let me, let me step into this. Um, if you go look at a lot of screeners, you know, they, they allow you to do things like just say, find the companies where the price is greater than 10 or the price is lower than 15 or the PE ratio is greater than 10% and so forth. Those were, those were helpful, but for me and for a lot of kind of, I will say advanced finance guys, being able to build an expression where you have variables on the left and the right is important. And that's really kind of the genesis of this. Um, and that's why it looks more complicated. It's a lot more powerful uh, but it's a lot more complicated. So is the data available to premium subscribers? You know, we have some data that's free, that's free but most of the uh, most of the really interesting stuff uh, is, is premium. And that's really goes to support, you know, our efforts on, on trying to increase the product value. Uh, you know, we're a small business. Uh, we have five, six engineers on staff, uh, almost exclusively working on stuff here. Um, and so the money goes, you know, to basically furthering the, the product development and finding more data that we can turn into something that's really in indicative of future price movements. Um, what is the best way to filter out the insider purchases with their automatic incentives and other insider payments which are not direct P purchases? So I, I think the answer to your question is to look at like, you know, it's a good, it's a good question. And, you know, I, I do, all of that goes right here. So all of the stuff that's interesting, that's, that's a non-plan and it's an open market purchase. It's gonna show up here in the track records of insider purchases. Um, I don't know if you're trying to do this over like the entire, entire universe. Let me go take a look at the insider data here. This is, this is another thing that we have, latest insider trades. Um, if I go to this toolbar up here and I go to the latest insider trades, um, let's see what happens. How we, oh, it's 945, so uh, we've covered a lot of ground here. 
Um, this is actually really something that we put a lot of effort into, um, the insider trade data. Um, I think the answer to your question is what, what, you're, what you're asking about is significant buying. Um, uh, we're, we're, we're trying to build, this is another kind of leaderboard type thing. Um, which are not direct repeat purchases. Um, I don't know the answer to that question. Rory, well, you're gonna to have to take, take it up with me on, uh, later on in regards to that, but I don't think I'm answering your question. I don't think I can answer your question. Um, if you wanna just see the latest transaction, you can come here. Um, uh, you can see here that we're, we're tagging these as auto trades or not. Um, we, I'm, I'm kind of building a quant model. Uh, and, and so this is kind of the, the, uh, the results of that quant model, uh, basically trying to find a uh, uh, percentage of float bought by insiders here. And so if you're look, looking at trying to discover uh, 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 companies that are interesting, then this is probably a good, a good place to go. Uh, we also do this thing where uh, we're starting to look at sectors. Um, and if you, take a, if, you, if you take all the companies in a sector and uh, you, you roll the insider trades up to that sector level, you can actually find total volume, which is interesting. But really you're looking at, what's interesting to me is the ratio of insider selling versus buying by sector. And so what this means is um, financials, the sell by ratio is 1.3. And so we go back 90 days and we look at everybody. That's, all, we, we count all of the insiders that, that are buying and we look at all the insiders that are selling in the last 90 days and we, and we divide them in. Information technology has got a huge sell by ratio. This is a very negative indicator, negative sentiment. If you were to go back a, a, a month ago, uh, financials would have been below one, which meant inside, financial insiders were actually, more of them were buying than were selling. Um, so, and then you can kind of go to our, we have a, a macro indicator up here. Uh, which is which is kind of more of the same, but we, we have some charts here. So here's the total market insider selling versus buying ratio. It's at an all it's at a peak that hasn't been met since December, you know, mid 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 2017. We take every company, every insider that's in the, that's in the United States that that supplies uh, insider data, and we go back. I think this is seven years, and we plot the ratio over 90 days against the S&P. And you know, to me, this is kind of a negative indicator. Look at what happened here. This is a big drop here. This may or may not have been predictive, but you can see kind of how these, these kind of correlate. You can see a correlation here as well, where the insider you know, started to decline here. When it's at a peak here, it's typically bad news. That's, that's the idea. That it's a high sell by ratio. It means insiders are selling more than, than buying. At this point, there are about 3.8 sellers for every buyer. This is for the total market. And, and, and the benchmark is SPY. You go further down, look at the energy. Look at what's happening to energy. Um, huge negative sentiment in energy right now. This is updated daily, even though the, the uh, uh, the tick marks are really kind of small, and, uh, but we do update this daily. Um, this is materials, you know, it's, it's whatever, it's, it's within a normal range. Uh, so you could actually argue, argue, arguably think about a, just an ETF strategy that, you know, was a low frequency strat strategy where you would buy, possibly buy, you know, negative sent, uh, um, sell negative sentiment and buy positive sentiment. The, po the positive sentiment ones would be the ones that are really low. And I don't, unfortunately, none of them are really low right now. Look at information technology. This is 18 to one. Um, the, uh, but look at real estate down here. This was, this was 0.5 back just a couple of months ago. I said, you know, pre COVID, I think that people thought this is gonna be, or this is right after COVID. Anyway, the, the idea is, I think you get the idea. Buy low, sell high, buy on, buy on positive sentiment. How do you see this data? This is right here on the tools, on the macro indicators right here. Um, do you drill down to individual companies with those Vanguard benchmarks? No, this is, so if you wanna go take a look at the actual 
but we have a whole industry browser that's that's you can dig into as well. So, and I should I should actually put links from here, but but I but I didn't. So if you want to go look at industry data, you can go into the industry browser here, and we have a lot of the same stuff. So here's energy with the sell by ratio, and you can go look at coal mining, for example. I have no idea what coal mining looks like these days, but let's let's look at Coal mining. There's only 27 companies in the coal mining industry in our database, uh, but and I don't even think I have the sell by ratios on this. Unfortunately, uh, this probably needs an update here. Uh, yeah, here's the sell by ratio dollar line. This is the sellers versus buyers. And this is kind of a kind of a crap um, chart, uh, but it kind of gives you this. This is the old version of the chart that we used to do. I haven't updated these charts lately. Uh, but you can kind of see that it's it's been bad recently. We can go look at uh, oil and gas extraction. There's 483 companies in this database, and kind of get a sense of like what's happening with them. Just uh, insiders. Um, so you know it's it's just what it is. It looks like it's pretty normal right now. Um, we're going to start doing things like the put call ratios as well um, in this. And so try, trying to really kind of identify more macro sentiment, macro sentiment indicators. Um, okay, so what else do we have here in the tools? Um, it's 9.49. We have about 10 minutes. I'm going to just keep talking here. Um, let me go back to the, to the dashboard here and talk about, or let me go back to... to Tesla SEC filings. Um, I've talked about SEC filings before. I personally find them very important. Um, uh, this is a page here. This is a page here that talks about all the SEC filings, or at least it organizes all the SEC filings that are available. Uh, on, you know, and we organize them by by um, by type. So we only have US. We're going to be adding Canada. And we will be recording this. This is being recorded and it will be available on YouTube. Um, this is all of Tesla's 8Ks. Within the 8Ks, they also oftentimes put press releases. So, you know, we pull those press releases out so you can see kind of what they are right here. So, this should say press releases from SEC filings. We're not getting press releases from PR Newswire. Uh, but you can click on this and you can actually see uh, their, their, their presentations right there on the top, right? So, it's kind of on. They, you know, because of the structure of SEC filings, most of the interesting data, most of the interesting things are, are kind of buried in exhibits. And if you go look at the 8K itself, you'll see that it's like, it's, it's considered an attachment. If you went to the SEC stuff, uh, the SEC site, you would, it would be hard for you to find all these attachments. And so we try to pull them all out here for you. Uh, you can see the quarterly and annual reports. You can actually see what changed from one report to the other. So I can click on track changes here. Here's the latest 10Q. What changed from this quarter to last quarter? Um, well, I can see they changed the date. Um, I can see they changed some numbers here. Um, I can see, you know, they changed the change the, the month. And I can go through here and they can see like where they're talking about, uh, um, you know, coronavirus and so forth. And they changed some numbers in these, in these tables. But you know, you can see stuff like this, where most of the S10 Qs are boilerplate, but they really kind of you know focus on um, you know trying to make sure that they, they disclose material stuff. And so this is a really interesting way to see uh, um, what's changed in the 10 Q or 10 K. Um, is there any correlation between the investments via 13B and the increase or decrease in stock price? I don't know the answer to that question. I can tell you that, it, that there's academic research that shows that activist investments, that there is, a, there is a high correlation, or at least there's a significant correlation between activist investments in companies. Now, so it turns out that activist investors have to file a 13B. So you could perhaps then argue that there would be a correlation between 13B filings and the increase in share price. That's actually one of the first things that I started looking into whenever I, whenever I started working on this. So on, on this site was, was kind of looking at 13B filings. 
13G filings are not as interesting because funds that file a 13G are filing a 13G, are only allowed to file a 13G if, they, if they're kind of guaranteeing to the SEC that they're not gonna get involved in the business. So that's the difference between a 13B and a 13G. 13G is for passive investors. They're gonna, they're gonna own, and, 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 and all these filings are basically, all these 13Bs and 13Gs are for companies that file, that, that own more than 5% of the company. If you, if, you, if you buy more than 5% of the company and you wanna be a passive investor, you're gonna file a 13G. If you own more than 5% of the company and you want to influence management, you know, by either, you know, trying to get on the board, you know, trying to, uh, uh, you know, do a proxy fight, that kind of thing, then you have to file a 13D, D as in Delta. And if you're looking at activist investors, then, then that's kind of where you want to go, is, is looking at time, stuff like this. Um, and we get JSON connection to the data. So we have a API, uh, APM developer hub right here. Um, here's the documentation. We use uh, uh, a third party to provide you with documentation here. And so there is JSON data. Um, we have a couple different data, a couple different endpoints. One of these, this web data API, basically is cleared, will allow you to put the data on a website. Um, without any kind of, it's, it's a limited data, so it might show you the top 10 owners, that kind of thing. Um, the premium data will give you all the data, but you're not allowed to display all the data on, on your website. You can use it for personal use only. A lot of people have asked us about getting like a full dump of the database. And look, I appreciate that, but we just, we're just not situated to do that right now. Uh, this is rate limited, so, um, you know, you're going to be able to download some of it. And you're going to be able to hit it frequently, but you know, we do limit the amount of data that you can download at one time, simply because we're just not set up to to, to have to do full dumps of data to people uh, at this time. It's just that's not not a priority for us right now. This data is available lots of places elsewhere. You have to pay a lot of money for it, but it's just not something that we're going to do right now. Um, and then there's things if you want to create a little app, you can actually mod update your your dashboard and subscribe and unsubscribe it to your stock list and stuff like that um, all through here. We also have, and I'm going to say one more thing about documents, about SEC filings. Um, if you do a search here for anything, you're going to see these SEC documents in here. You can see the prospectus. Um, and and we, we put, we have like, we have, um, about 14 million SEC documents in our database right now. And we're adding the UK Financial Conduct Authority. I don't know if there's a UK company in here. I'm not just familiar with UK. Maybe Tata Motors. I know that they're listed in the UK. Um, um, I'm not seeing anything here, but, but, but basically we're gonna be adding Canada filings as well. Um, and if you want to programmatically search you know, do for your full text searches on these companies. We actually offer that in the API as well. Um, can you send up text messages for alerts? We don't have that yet. It's something that's on the list of things to do. Uh, I, but I can tell you that if you go to alerts page, uh, it will ask you if you want to set up browser alerts and you can get browser alerts. Uh, so you can basically load this page here uh, and just set it up on your, on your browser. And then whenever there's a new alert, you'll get a browser alert. Um, text message alerts is on the list of engineering tasks to do. Um, if you can't get the browser alerts to look, then, then um, let me know after the fact, and I can probably help you out with that. Um, they work for me on Chrome and on, on Firefox. So, okay. Any other questions? It's 9:57. I'm almost lost my voice here. Um, we covered a lot of ground. Um, Will, would Fintel ever become a brokerage probably with commissions to avoid clearing houses? We probably would, will not become a brokerage. Um, I, don't, I don't know like what value we can provide over what's available right now. Um, I don't know like what competitive advantage we would have for that. So I try to think about how we can, how we can do, you know, grow the business and, and, and help people. And I just, you know, it's a good question. Um, but I, I don't, I don't, I don't see that in the in the near future. Uh, any reason why you, you think it would be good? You just got the curiosity part. 
Um, okay, look, I'm going to go ahead and close it up for now. Uh, look, I really appreciate you guys coming here and, and listening to what I had to say. Oh, okay. Will you ever be able to offer live dark pool data prints, block buys, or option sweeps? Okay, so I think we can offer block buys. Uh, I'm not as familiar with an option sweep. If you want to um, text me afterwards, let me know. Um, if you have ideas, look, these are all great ideas. What I would love you to do would be to come over here to the Teams page and go to the welcome, okay? And like share your ideas on the, on the welcome group. Uh, because I'm there regularly and I, and, I, and I get notified. So join me there and, and, and let's continue the conversation. Yes, it's recorded. If you do a Google search, if you get on YouTube and you search for Fintel webinar, you'll see all the past webinars. I don't always cover the same information, so please go listen to the old ones. This one will be up on, on YouTube, I'll say by the end of the day. So I would say within a couple hours, okay? Um, thanks again. I'm going to do another webinar next week at the same time on the stock screener. I already, I covered the stock screener just a little bit just now, uh, but I'll go a lot further into detail next week with it. So if you're interested in that, then you can join me then as well, okay? All right, take care everybody. And thanks again for all your time and for your attention.